at Columbia <coughs> University, and uh, he's going to introduce the speakers tonight. So please welcome uh, Tendashi Oshima. Thank you, Valentin, and um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, excuse me, uh, chair this evening's uh, multiple lectures uh, on responding to Tokyo. That, of course, follows the um, opening of the exhibitions um, last Friday of the um, bathhouse by Klein Dytham in the uh, gallery and in the front members' room upstairs of um, Tokyo Design's Catalyst, Tokyo Catalyst exhibition, um, which is, I think, very interesting because you see many different sides of Tokyo that it's not singular um, by any means. And um, you, know, you get an inside view, an outside view. Um, and um, to respond to this topic of Tokyo, perhaps the best thing for us would be all to get on a plane and go over there. But at the same time, in some ways, when you're there, you aren't able to get a perspective on the city as a whole. Um, and also, as um, Mark and um, everyone was mentioning earlier, they rarely see each other, um, all of the <laughs> architects, because you know, they're so busy or um, whatever. But um, it's really an opportunity for us to um, um, think about this um, in a broader um, global context in some ways. And I think there's some other architects um, from Tokyo that um, can help us out um, for our discussion. Um, but um, first of all, let me see, actually. Let me introduce our architects um, that we have here. Um, it's tonight's pairing of lectures uniquely highlights two young collaborative practices with their partners trained in architecture here in London, but now practicing in Tokyo. Uh, Teledesign, here we have, um, is a collaborative network of seven designers founded in 1999. Um, and their work will be presented uh, by Noriyuki Tajima, um, here on my left, and um, who received his diploma from the AA here in 1992 and is currently teaching at Kanto Gakuin and Kogakuin Universities. Um, and uh, Nobuyuki Nomura here, um, who also received his diploma from the AA in 1994 and is a visiting lecturer at Hong Kong Polytech University. No. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> it used to be. Oh, okay, used to be. Um, the firm Klein Dytham was established in Tokyo by um, Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham in 1991. Um, Astrid, as a truly international individual, was um, born in Italy, received a degree in interior design in France, and then received a Master of Arts degree in, the architecture, in architecture at the Royal College of London, um, Royal College of Art here in London, um, where she met Mark Dytham. And together, um, they went to Tokyo in uh, 1988, I believe. Um, on our scholarship and first work uh, for Toyo Ito, um, actually where I first met them. But um, in addition to maintaining uh, their approximately 10-person firm, Astrid is an assistant professor at Nihon University um, and lecturer at Keio University, and Mark is an assistant professor at um, Tokyo Science University and lecturer at Hosei University, if I'm correct. Um, Now, to situate tonight's talk and discussion, I would like to now give you a brief overview of Tokyo. Actually, can we turn the lights down in the back? Actually, I'll see the, yeah, the front the, ones. The front well. ones. Yeah. <laughs> we'll make it. Actually, this one too is fine. Great, thank you. Now, looking at the metropolis of Tokyo today, we confront the question of how to read and interpret its myriad of buildings. Is it simply an urban chaos, reflecting the failure of modern planning to create a uniform, coordinated environment um, like the Royal Crescent at Bath? Or is it, as Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown have noted, a convincing chaos? Or perhaps can it be best called a metropolitan plasma? One rational means of understanding this urbanscape is through the strict sunshine laws that dictate the volumes and roof angles of individual buildings, but not their architectural styles. Therefore, as Venturi and Scott Brown noted, in Tokyo there is room for not one, but many taste systems, and architecture is perhaps freer and more varied than anywhere else in the world, as I think the um, installations clearly um, show. But 
Yet in lieu of a uniform urban grid or a straight triumphant access, such as the Champs Elysees in Paris, what is the underlying organization of the city's built environment? Was the city planned from the microcosmic level to the macrocosmic level or the other way around? Now, today's um, lecture will be going back and forth between <coughs> the two firms, and uh, the basic organization is as I told them, to um, present a small project, a medium project, and a large project. And so we'll see, um, at least through scale, some um, of the connections and perhaps differences um, in approaches. To give you a brief um, introduction, or to give you a few clues to, that might begin to answer some of these questions, I'll now take you on a very brief roller coaster ride through the history of this Asian metropolis. As we saw in the first image, um, and here in these two, um, one organizational and psychological focal point for Tokyo can be seen here to be Mount Fuji. Um, and in these two illustrations, we see um, depictions separated by nearly 150 years. However, today, pollution and extensive high-rise buildings make Mount Fuji virtually invisible to most residents. Nevertheless, its occasional sighting, especially during the winter months, <coughs> confirm the continuity of particular connective elements. So within this context, I will look to a few of the seen and unseen factors that guide the formation and, uh, of the built environment of Tokyo. <coughs> now, it's important to remember that Tokyo's pre-modern incarnation was Edo. This originally modest city existed since 1180 on a bay at, um, on the central part of the island of Honshu. It was not until the end of the 16th century that it developed as a newly planned castle town to house the Tokugawa, Tokugawa shogunate from 1603 to 1867. Edo became a great constructed landscape in which the existing topography and rivers were wedded with a network of roads and canals. As depicted in numerous screen paintings and maps, the city of Edo expanded out from the castle in a roughly spiral pattern that used a system of moats and rivers to protect and divide the capital. In particular, Edo's canals and rivers, beyond their protective purpose, contributed to the dy dynamic fluid character of the city which we can see literally through Tokyo's multi-layered water spots. Or in the physical transformation of many districts, um, including this of Ginza, as well as um, I think water is one connective element um, of the two exhibitions. If we see the bathhouse of the virtual water, and um, as we saw in the previous image, um, Tokyo Canal water space as um, part of Teledesign's own research. Now, in looking at Ginza, we can see here um, that it, it's changed dramatically from its um, late 19th century incarnation, um, and Ginza being a, uh, literally, meaning um, the place where the um, silver coins were minted. Uh, so it's changed dramatically from that time when also it was uh, constructed to look much like Regent Street, to um, the 1960s, as we see on the right, or a more contemporary version. Also, take your, Tokyo's major rebuilding projects um, took, uh, have occurred continuously. Um, the most prominent is the 1923 earthquake um, and World War II, whose destruction we see um, here on the left. Um, but also um, the preparation for the 1964 Olympics, uh, which we can see here highlighted in Kenzo Tange's Olympic stadiums. Dynamic sculptural masterpieces that we can see elements of in perhaps the uh, current proposed stadiums for Lom London's own Olympic bid. So for Tokyo, its selection for the 1964 Olympics became a catalyst for the country to rebuild the capital as its economy began to soar. This plan to rebuild the city and improve its urban infrastructure included the construction of elevated highways above the existing waterway system, construction of a monorail between Haneda Airport and the city center, eight subway lines, and the Tokaido bullet train. Olympic in scale and aspiration, the plan indelibly changed the character of the city as a positivist expression of modern progress. However, looking today at Tokyo, we can see um, 
a perhaps a more real version of what, what we're left with, um, and these multiple <laughs> layers of these utopian visions um, of the highway system superimposed upon the waterway system, one in which was originally planned to be um, controlling the city um, through the moats, and um, the other really trying to open up the city f with free access. Oops. Um, as some other responses by architects to this situation, we can see here um, in the 1960s on the left, um, Kikutake's Marine City, um, with this fantastic vision, perhaps akin to some of those of Archigram, and also Kenzo Tange in his uh, plan of 1960, in which he extended the growth of the city in a linear fashion out into the bay. Now, while a lot of these schemes really didn't take place in their full um, scale, we can see them appearing in um, individual buildings. Um, Kikutake, although he didn't fully realize this marine city, did build this hotel, um, part of uh, the Weno district, the Kozmina Hotel. Or also um, Kisho Kurokawa built his um, capsule tower, um, which uh, was perhaps one of the most symbolic and um, uh, masterpiece ex um, examples of uh, the metabolist movement, in which buildings would change over time um, and be replaced by certain elements as they became out of date. Unfortunately, the scheme was perhaps more utopian than realistic, and so as we see here, the um, capsules are more of storage units than um, actual units for um, salary <coughs> workmen to stay after um, work um, if they've missed their last train. But yet in another incarnation of Tokyo, um, a perhaps more contemporary one, we see uh, these smaller towers being replaced by um, much larger ones. Um, here on the left is the Shiodome district, which is right across the street from the uh, Kurokawa capsule tower with a um, tower by Jean Nouvel and uh, Richard Rogers, um, as well as the Ropongi Hills district um, with that very large tower in the center, and then also in the Marunouchi <coughs> district uh, in central Tokyo. But in contrast to this very large-scale Tokyo, we do see the persistence of a much more um, small-scale, individual, um, design, um, perhaps most famously depicted through the minimalist um, designs such as Ando's um, row house in Sumiyoshi, um, although that actually is in, um, in Osaka. Um, we see also um, Toyo Ito's White House um, in Nakano, also, um, also from the same time of 1976. But while we see the purity of these images, we also see perhaps the more vernacular image of this micro scale um, the Tokyo style um, book um, highlighting these kind of units that um, are um, perhaps what many more people li um, live in and um, the Akihabara micro um, computer district um, which um, shows also this very small scale of the city but one that does dominate the organization. Again it's one city that's constantly changing over time and through the seasons <coughs> We see here this um, notion depicted in Hiroshige's prints um, of the cherry blossom seasons or the Tanabata festival, but um, one which you might not ever see if you just only visit during the summer um, when it's very hot and humid. And so that was specifically one of the um, elements that Toyo Ito tried to capture in his own um, monument, this, uh, the Tower of Winds that's um, outside of Yokohama Station. But here, um, <coughs> rather than just being a um, cooling tower for the, the station, it changes, as we see, through the different um, times of day and different seasons. Or here, um, even the platform can change um, through the seasons. Um, this uh, very um, dated photographs from the 60s, but where um, this train platform on the, the right can actually be a beer garden. But so coming back to our featured architects, we see the different scales. Um, we see where a chair can be um, a, a motive for a, or a strategy for um, addressing the city. 
or see it on a much more um, domestic scale in a su suburban or semi-urban space, or um, to the large scale of the city itself. So tonight, we have the great opportunity to hear about these multiple possibilities of design in Tokyo that um, I think are really uniquely uh, in reach of young, ambitious architects, um, perhaps more so than here in London. So first we'll have um, Teledesign present, and then we'll have um, Klein Dighton. There are some seats free here if people want to take advantage. <laughs> you can fall asleep if you want. Thanks <laughs> so much. <laughs> Okay, um, my name is uh, Noriyuki Tajima, and um, uh, this is Nobuyuki Nomura, and we are from Teledesign, Tokyo. Um, uh, let me have a little introduction about us. Uh, maybe some people uh, don't know about us. Um, Teledesign is an uh, open collaboration network organization working in uh, architecture, urbanism, and other related fields, and in order to facilitate effective cross-disciplinary practice. Uh, we established Teledesign in 1999 and working in the uh, urbanism and architecture and some other smaller designs. And um, <coughs> Teledesign is a sort of agency for architects and designers who already work independent, in, independently within various specialist areas. And there are seven core members, a number of affiliated network members, and also groups that uh, we collaborate with. We make up a team appropriate for each project and try to take advantage of the shifting role of each member to formulate a unique creative dynamic. This is for us an important strategy not only for practical reason but also to instigate the best circumstances for investigation investigating urban condition and scapes of Tokyo. This drawing shows our concept chart for the exhibition, um, which is happening uh, uh, upstairs uh, uh, front members' room. A left side, a list of left side shows selected projects of architecture and furniture, and right hand side uh, shows our urban research done in the past. Uh, we have always been investigating urbanism in order to seek for new possibilities of urban and architectural concepts and solutions while working on an actual project to be built. We don't intend to work on the field of urban planning, but rather intend to find out the changing situation of space and architecture through urbanism. Therefore, these separate works are done uh, in parallel, but uh, produce stimulation and exchanging in ideas and concept. We try to draw out its relation by placing important concept and words in the middle uh, between them, and blue colored uh, concept words, phrases are rather uh, for architecture, and red colored uh, concept of uh, phrases are rather urban. And uh, this drawing is a plan for the exhibition upstairs and architectural projects are situated in the central structure. 
and urban research is a pinup along the surrounding walls. And location of these projects are decided according to the, these eight concept phases so that viewers are able to see, the, uh, see and work out the similarity and contingency between our architecture and urban projects. Okay, so now we start uh, the planning about small scale project. Uh, responding to the concept of activity setting and behavioral cognition. A Tamachi workshop we've done in 1998, this workshop proposed to investigate such an act of mapping or act of experiencing the city. We chose two routes around Tamachi Station in Tempo, Tokyo to work out how the imagination of the larger city is related to personal experience and how the reality of the city is conceived with individual perception. These two drawings show the activity happen when people walk through the two routes. Within such simple activity, activity <coughs> walking, there are many actions and reactions, subconscious glances performed at every moment. What to look at, what to think or associate, stopping, slowing down, and so on. This drawing shows the moment when one passes through the ticket wicket at the station and how the perception is related to that. There are directional focuses corresponding to the action of the body, crossing a boundary from outside to inside while associated memory thought is invoked. There are many such mental thresholds in the city, sometimes discontinuous, sometimes continuous. Respond to that urban research we designed furniture in collaboration with a public furniture company. <coughs> we designed this bench as a kind of interactivity between perception and body. It is for situation in public space such as a lobby or an airport terminal. When you sit, the bench changes its shape to fit the body shape. When you stand, the bench slowly returns back to the original shape. It thus reveals and visualizes a bodily action and relationship to the bench itself. The bench utilizes the soft plastic flexibility of a urethane form and a hinged steel frame system. And we can see how many people were intrigued enough to try it out. They approach and examine it and find out the use and whether it is comfortable. And it was certainly. Okay, uh, next project is Black Box One. Storage in, oh, uh, storage in Kanagawa pre Prefecture. This is the smallest building we have done, six square meter. A storage facility uh, designed to reflect the activity of storing. <coughs> the design of the walls and doors came from the study of how the different items could be uh, stored. You you lean long, longer things like a mop or a piece of wood, while other things would be stacked and shelved. The, the irregular design of the exterior is just a reflection of the regulated function within the interior, the in, internal walls, doors, and shelves. Social landscape. Uh, this workshop drawing is of a public square in Ikebukuro, a busy interchange station in central Tokyo. Uh, the architect who originally designed uh, this square imagined an ancient Greek forum of a Roman piazza where people gathered and created public and communal <coughs> discourse. Our research revealed how people actually use this square in fact, people do not talk to each other at all. Uh, the persons next to you are more like unknown shadows ignoring each other. While some people talk continuously on their mobile phone to absent bodies, others just gaze at and uh, through the clouds. Each person seems to, me, uh, seems to bent on create, creating his private space more so in this public environment than in the private. Uh, next one is the Andres tool. In response with this tool, we designed the way people can recover a relationship to each other. 
using Pascal theory, oil damper are connected with each other under the ground. When one sits down on the seat, others too rise according to the amount of pressure. <coughs> when one stands up, others too fall correspondingly. Even though you may want to be alone in the crowd, maintaining your little private zone, each cheated neighbor will intrude upon your privacy, and you actually have to wake up. Here you are in public. <laughs> okay. That's the most fence section finished. Okay. Oh, is that what it works? I see. Okay, so Ken, thank you for your introduction. Um, I'm Mark Dytham and Astrid Klein. Um, just as a, a short introduction, I think um, one of the key things is we don't really see ourselves as um, a Japanese office, um, and we don't really see ourselves as a British or European office. We really see ourselves as a Tokyo office, and really all, all of our work um, over the last 10, 10, 10 years in Japan has really been a response to Tokyo, we think. And having a chat to Ken about this before was quite interesting. Um, we're not really about kendo and judo and kudo, all of those uh, things that uh, really inter interested us probably before we went to Japan. But we came very, very, very interested in the city and urbanism and um, commercialism, I think, just the actual the energy that um, Tokyo gives, gives off with convenience stores and the 24-hour nature of the city. I think we go straight into it. Straight into it. Okay. So we've got um, three projects. The first one is a small, small one. <laughs> and this project is for Bloomberg, the financial news services company. They have 160 offices around the world, and they have uh, about 300 people in Tokyo. And this is located on the ground floor of um, a brand new building in T Tokyo called the Shinmaru Building. It's right opposite Tokyo Station. And Bloomberg have two floors of that building, tw 21st and 22nd floor. And on the ground floor of this building is a large shopping centre, three-storey sh sh shopping centre. And they were looking for um, a gateway into their office, something that they could walk their customers past or p people could bump in into and begin to realise what Bl Bl Bloomberg was about. So it was um, you know, a very soft piece of advertising. Um, initially... They were thinking of an internet cafe, something like that. We were trying to push the boundaries um, a little bit f further and try and see what we could do. Now, it's a very cutting-edge company, and uh, lots of technologies um, they use to, to harvest financial information from around the world. Um, when you go into their offices, you're, you are blinded by all these stock tick -tick tickers that are running uh, <coughs> prices of um, com companies all, all, all around the world. So. We tried to take that as a theme, and uh, this is how Bloomberg Ice, this in interactive, um, we actually saw it as an interactive icicle that hung from um, the ceiling. The joke that was Bloomberg Iceberg, so something like that, as, as, as a start point. But we saw that this, this notion of ice as something quite refreshing. Um, we called it ice, then Bloomberg called it interactive communication experience which is quite a Japanese, the Japanese people within the company thought they've got to make ice into a symbol. We couldn't just have the pure a rather, joke. Rather serious. Um, as Mark said, Bloomberg was quite keen to, um, that um, they would get a friendly image amongst the people who uh, are not investing in stock market and are not uh, really interested in financial uh, news. And uh, so we thought, okay, rather than having the boring uh, ticker tapes kind of running across a screen, um, we'll um, distort them a little bit. And uh, we worked together with uh, Toshio Iwai. Um, some of you might know him, quite an, in, an uh, a well known artist in um, interactive media. And what you see here is the ticker tape uh, fonts inflating when the stock is up and it deflates and falls down the screen like a sand clock, is that what you call yeah. it? 
um, which uh, looks very funny unless you're obviously invested in that particular stock. But also when you hold your hand on the screen, the ticker tape starts jumping over your hand. Um, this was one way of distorting the uh, financial data, but we thought we'd add uh, a few games to that. And what you see here is the harp game. And uh, obviously it makes music as you kind of play harp across the screen. We'll, we'll run a video at the end. You can play volleyball, very popular in Japan. <laughs> or the link, digital link game. <coughs> or the digital shadow. I think one thing to, to note here, it, the, the whole um, <coughs> screen, it's actually double-sided, there's 80,000 LEDs inside, and there's um, an infrared feedback system on a pitch of 100, mil, 100, 100 millimeters, which mm. gives it this interactivity. Um, the, when it was installed, it was quite an interesting thing, when it was installed, the stock market had crashed in Japan, but we didn't know that. And all the stocks kept just dropping off, and no stock had gone up, and we thought there was a bug in the system, until <laughs> so we found out that uh, it was actually a really bad day on the stock market. Um, when, when you enter the space, um, to start with, the, tick, the, tick, the ticker tapes are just running across, but when you get within about 30 centimetres of the screen, it, it detects your presence, and then a, then a menu comes on, and you'll see that in a second. Uh, on a busy weekend, there um, are about 2,000 visitors. We get 2,000 on a children packet. It's actually packed on a week weekend, and people just there's there's no other sign other than the Bloomberg lo logo um, and some soft advertising either side. Yeah, um, that's the. I can turn this on a little bit. Let it go. Let it go. <coughs> So you can see that's the digital harp, um, and you see it's quite sensitive. There's sound. Do you want to put that mic on? Um, and once you leave it for about five seconds, um, the menu will come down, and you can select each of the four options. This is the digital shadow. And you can see I don't t actually, actually have to touch, t touch it to get a reaction from the board. <laughs> so again, after five seconds, the menu comes down, and this is the connection. Okay. You can see I'm a real show off here. then someone will come in the mid middle and you get this. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of amazing the reaction you get from pe pe people in here. We walk in and all sorts of people are playing. On, on one end there's a ch child, on the other end there's a biz bi businessman. So it's this amazing sense of connection. Once a grandmother was throwing herself against the screen and then they decided they better put a guard there telling people <laughs> off to <laughs> She was be getting so excited with a volleyball. <laughs> and this is the last one, I think this is the... Uh, this is, this is a volleyball. And again, this is, this is really interesting. You get all sorts of p people, the ball mo moves down, and people standing beside suddenly start in, in, interacting with one another. Um, the way this responds to Tokyo maybe is um, Japanese people are very um, keen on gadgets, and uh, the newest one is possible, right? <laughs> I think the other thing um, is interesting to note, we, we actually made this without a contract, um, and I think it was only po possible in Japan. We'd worked with all the contractors be before. Um, you'll see our um, interactive billboard a bit later. Um, and there were five companies involved, and because Bloomberg isn't a U.S. company, we're talking to their lawyers. They said if you actually push this co contract across the U U U.S., they, they won't approve it. So we built it without a con co contract. 
as soon as the project manager for the US came over to see it fi finished, the first question he asked was, what, what contract did you run it un un under? And in fact, it was the Japanese con contract of, of trust and goodwill. And uh, for a very complex thing like that, it was a pretty amazing uh, feat. OK? Great. Actually, showing the volleyball image is perfect, because we'll throw the ball back to uh, <laughs> tell oh. the at this point for <laughs> our medium scale uh, presentations. Okay, so now um, I'd like to start medium scale. Um, uh, this section, uh, uh, we'd like to talk about uh, something called, we call it the program programmatic intervention and heat condition. And today, uh, mobile phones and internet terminals are no longer by necessity uh, physically straighted in buildings. And this gives a freedom for personal and business transaction to be conducted outside buildings in public space. Moreover, in Tokyo, there are numerous people flow from suburban to central Tokyo and from center to suburban every day. In such continuous flow, public space just become a passing place and then people ignore each other, a mass of anonymous flow. The way people behave and the characteristics of outside public space have become very much transformed. Uh, one clear example is how the location telephone is moved through historical development. When telephone was introduced several decades ago, it is situated only in the public buildings of each area. The telephone was taken as a public gateway to the other areas and only used mainly for official purposes. When telephone moved its location to each house during economic development period, it was set next to the main entrance of the house and thus was more like a protocol for guests. This continues up to 70s. During 80s, the telephone extension of more lines, sometimes wireless, and reached into private rooms. It, become, it became more private and people started using it for long intimate chatting. It is thus no longer an official gateway. When people form, uh, uh, sorry, when mobile phone became common, telephone entirely lost its relation to the physical space. People started using it as an immediate on and off of personal and private zone within urban space. Uh, this is a <coughs> this is a project protocol for exhibition space. It's designed. Uh, its design came from analysis of the Tokyo public space. We collected together different forms of public space, like uh, working space, train space, internet space, or TV media space, telephone space, and so on. Each booth has a particular and a typical construction, a reconstruction of the experience. Like in a trainscape, uh, the booth is always jam-packed. Uh, shoulders touch each other, it's so narrow, and the transparent plastic screens prevent you from taking to each other. It's a very strange space similar to the elevator space. In the TV booth, there's a monitor screen. You can watch through the monitor what is going on inside another booth. It is one way of broadcasting. But you are not aware that uh, you are shot by the hidden video camera uh, to be watched in a further booth. Uh, these are collected together and set above one circular base, as if it is a common and shared public space. But to enter the booth, you must bend down and walk. When you stand up, you may be aware that others are in the neighboring booth, but you cannot see what they do. Uh, this situation is, I believe, quite Tokyo-like. Uh, then going to the building project. This project is for a family, uh, family with a newspaper delivery business, numbering a distribution of the thousands every morning and afternoon. Their business operation is quite complex. 
Morning delivery is at around 6 o'clock. Then, during midnight, they need the preparation of folding up thousands of newspaper and pile them up together for delivery cars. Then, they need for the process again for the afternoon delivery at around 3 o'clock in the morning. It's, oh no, at, at three, o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, sorry. <laughs> it includes two houses, dormitory, an office, and a workshop, and the parking. It's so complicated. So they have their family to, or, or private life simultaneously, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and sleeping. These business operation and the private together, it becomes a complex 24 hours operation, can become a life of the confusion, and it used to be, but we designed very carefully the division and the connection. They are all separated in function, but necessarily interconnected to enable a 24 hours operation. This shows the entrance for house B, and the stairs for the dormitory. Exterior surface reflect the internal division of each space, and each volume has independent entrance and enclosure. While there are kinds of hidden doors to allow shortcut for work efficiency. This is house A. And house B that are closed in, but open towards the inner courtyard. The office area is fully glazed and open to the street side. This office space is situated at the center, and the other volumes are connected to this space. Thus, the office is regarded as a communal square for the family who runs the twen this 24-hour business. And the next uh, key term is a hindered condition. I'd like to talk about uh, this term, hinged condition. This term, hinged condition, describes an ongoing investi investigation and interest so far for 10 years. And this early object was made to illustrate the architectural concept of sectioning and turning. <coughs> Crumbled back paper was put inside liquid plaster, and when happened, it was cut section by section down to each hinge. It represents a record of sifting space from one to another. Slight variations give you imagination of fluidity of space. We consider there are many such events occurring in the urban situation. There exists this alternative change in every section of the city. OK, I'll show you the project WL House in the next. The location for this is in the suburb of Yokohama, near Tokyo, in a typical residential area. There are two stru uh, strategies we took. One was to reflect the hilly location, and the other was to create a kind of open floor of activities. First, there is a platform that allows open activity. This is lifted up to separate public and private division. Next is was bent and enclosed to differentiate inside and outside of the space. The four boxes are laid for four different activities, which become the pivot for the rest of the open space, where dwellers act freely to use for own activities. This picture shows the scene of the exterior. I hope that you can see the L-shaped floors. There is the interior picture. The L shape was uh, skips upwards and allows the dweller to walk up or down. Changing relationships of the activity to the courtyard, decks, and the surrounding context. Uh, the next uh, housing project is a uh, housing is project named Sea House. The project illustrates hinged condition in that its program is interchangeable or shifting. It is a private house that is also a cafe <coughs> restaurant. The size is around 100 square meter, which is too small to contain both a house and a cafe <coughs> restaurant. 
In Tokyo, commercial and residential area are often mixed up. And uh, this site is exactly situated where these two types face each other. And the center square is the site. Uh, in this drawing, you can see that commercial area wrap up the residential area. It is a kind of interface or reversible point of two areas. The client would like to open up part of the house as a residence, uh, res restaurant cafe, and even though it is such a small building, she also needed to live there. The solution was to design a kind of alternative spa alternating space. Cafe counter in the basement, uh, serves as both her kitchen and for the restaurant, while uh, an upper restaurant lounge could be shifted to be a living or a guest room. The black box is maintained wholly private, so in a way the public and commercial district came into the building and was wrapping it up, but its use could be at any moment reversible. <coughs> there is a door in the halfway of the stairs. By opening and closing it, she can shift the situation between the private and the public. As a person moves through the inside space, the black box surface becomes a ceiling, wall, finally a uh, floor. The C-shaped open cafe space surrounds the black box and works as a filter for the private box space towards the city. Yeah, finished in the medium section. Okay, this is our medium-sized uh, project. It's um, Another under... Another black box. <laughs> 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 this is how you respond to Tokyo, black boxes. <laughs> uh, now it's an um, uh, undercover lab, which is a, a fashion studio for a young fashion designer um, who is in his early 30s. He's a uh, very undercover himself, a very shy guy. And um, the site he uh, bought for this project is undercover in itself. It's, although it's in, a, in, in very lively Harajuku, it's in the back streets. And the, um, the, the site is tucked away from the main street. So you have to, 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 go to access the site, you have to walk under this tube. And uh, what you see as uh, clad up in brick is the main building in the back. I think it's worth noting on that slide, that is the context you have to build in, really no con context. Um, the building on uh, your right, um, this was actually, there was a timber house there. And while we were building it, it was demolished. And this um, sort of system built house was built there. There's a temporary wall, which is, it always seems to be built. That's, not, that's nothing at all to do with us. Then you've got this kind of sort, of sort of mess on the other side. So there really is no context at all. Um, we had a four meter wide uh, driveway to deal with, which was 12 meters long, that ran into the site, which is actually 12 meters square at the back. So it's almost a flag shaped <coughs> site. Um, the client, the, the main, it's actually his, as Astrid said, his uh, headquarters for fashion designer. And um, during the year, every six, six, six months, he produces a new collection, like all fashion, fashion designers, and needs um, a press room. And his request for this site was a 20 meter long single ra rail where he could hang the whole collection for each season. Now the only 20 meter length actually ran along this, because the square at the back was only 12 meter square, we had to run this. Um, along the roadway, the, with the approach road. Um, then we found out that if we started to put columns down, we'd have to keep 500 mi mi millimetres away from the boundary, and so suddenly you can't actually drive a truck or, or a car un underneath, and you needed to park five cars. So um, the solution actually developed its, it, itself. We had to cantilever 
this tube forward and you had to drive under it without any, without any columns to accommodate the, the vans and, 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 and cars. But it had the added advantage that it actually brought the building forward to the road um, as opposed to being this sort of setback thing. So you had this stealthy box which came forward. But we also imagine because he's such a shy guy, he would stand at the front of the tube and uh, look when uh, unwanted <laughs> guests were coming. And uh, at, what, at which point he would then escape into his basement studio. It's a bit like a, a telescope. Okay. This is uh, at the front here. You see the entrance to the uh, storeroom. And uh, underneath that storeroom is his uh, studio, which I think we have a slide later on. Oh, never mind. Uh, in this is the inside the press tube. The 20 meter long rail is on your left, and what you see on the right is just a reflection of it to make it look wider. This press tube also doubles up as a little catwalk on top. You can go back. You can see the, the rail on the top there. So during um, during Fashion Week, he uses the whole building as um, an exhibition area or a catwalk that on, on the top there. Pe pe people stand around the bit building. They have fashion shows outside and inside. Um, responding to Tokyo, this is uh, not responding at all, as Mark was saying earlier on. Uh, you still can see the uh, construction fence here. But also, um, Jun Takahashi is uh, uh, a band member of the Tokyo Sex Pistols. He's a punk and absolutely in love with London. And as such, um, he asked us to um, clad his building with uh, yellow London bricks. No, we just wanted he, wanted, he wanted it to feel like London is back. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of had to, we eventually after talking to him more and more, he was in love with London bricks. And uh, so I came back to London and started looking around and went to Lasden's in Mile End. And if you've ever been there, it's a second-hand brickyard. And started having a chat with the guys. and. It became clear that it's the it's the London yellow that he's in love in love with. There's a there's this brick which the whole of London is made from, and Lasdens have lots of sets of second hand ones. They're sixty pence each, and so uh, I went in there in my suit, and I think the guy thought I was going to make a garden wall with it. When, when I ordered ten thousand of them, which is t which is two container loads, um, he was quite surprised. So they were sh shipped over, and what that actually does is. Um, we, we started off wanting to build it from these brick, these two enormous massive brick brick walls which actually supported the cantilever. Um, in the end it became quite a pr problem in Tokyo because the second hand bricks, because they were second hand, they couldn't prove their actual strength. Mm -hmm. So in the end uh, we had to we had to have a con concrete wall and clad them. Um, we got over that um, hot horror by trying to imagine it as a, a piece of cloth or something that Jun would use. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like a fa fashion in, in itself. And it's almost more like wearing a tweed jacket, in this case, London, uh, yellow jacket. And this is in the basement. Um, the tube, you, there, there are two tubes. There's the black tube, which runs um, on my back all the way across, but also there's a concrete tube, which runs across the actual, this main double basement void. Um, and the, the other thing with Jun, He's in Tokyo Sex, sex Pistols. He, horse, he also hates exposed con for concrete the, the, with, with the Ando type co concrete, which is obviously very ja Japanese. And Jun is really anti that. So what we've done here is we've actually used the formwork as the finish to um, the underside of this big con co concrete tube. So the ceiling you see there is actually the plywood form, formwork. You put that first, and then you pull the co concrete on top. And normally you would take that away to actually expose the concrete. We've actually decided to leave it there and we've de detailed it as such. With all the concrete dribbles. With all the concrete drip, drip, drips coming through. <laughs> all right. Mm. That's um, our medium project. Mm. 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 Yes. 
、参った。<笑><笑>僕あったよ。The next slide that I scared. Responding to the idea of the public domain and the shifting situation. Here we share our urban research project done with Hong Kong Polytechnic University called Hong Kong Tokyo Workshop. Here we try to work out the changing avenues in this global and telecommunication society. This workshop process is very complicated, so I explain. This diagram shows our strategy to intervene the experience of two locations. Yeah. As if they experience to be a kind of a world traveler. First of all, students of each country start expecting the, the another country and start exchanging their ideas through the internet. So, this is a Hong Kong student and a Tokyo student. This is the first stage. Then Tokyo students visited Hong Kong to investigate together about urbanism in the real site. Uh, then they continue to work together while they are separating back to own country and at the end present together through the video conference. This experiment brings up a lot of issues that urbanism is today so much affected by media oriented image and single and mere experience can be altered by the preliminary image and experiences. Architecture is not out of this globalization. The next project we will show you is a proposal for a nominated competition for a global entertainment and computer company. This was the ideal project for us the concept being so close to our style of working. The <laughs> client wanted to build a global headquarters of building and they needed the idea of work sharing space for workers and we asked uh, uh, who are spread across the globe. The idea of ubiquitous and broadband network had to be combined with physical collaborative space. We made up the concept Gauss, G-A-U-S-S, -S, which is a term associated with a German scientist, Gauss, who worked in magnetic theory. In this project, Gauss stands for Global Architecture for Ubiquitous Space Synchronization. Here, the word architecture means not only architecture of architectural design, but also architecture of information technology, which is structure of information. So the phrase global architecture suggests in this project a global information structure that can be integrated with physical space or architecture. The design is composed of four major parts and project docs for intensive project work, a platform for effective work sharing and support system, A buffer zone is for informal meetings and exchanges. And media decks for broadband and telepresence of world information. These components meet together around the central buffer zone and they are interactivated. An organic institution where wireless positioning devices and identification system allow the workers to access to all the facilities as well as to the groupware at any place wherever, wherever they are. It is a massive building, the size of 100 meter square uh, cubic shape, and the size of the uh, site areas, uh, uh, no, the size of the floor area is 40 hectares. It is the size of baseball stadium. And this is a, uh, the square a cube. <coughs> I did the project project docs and the platform in between, and then this uh, in between space is a switching hub, where people can connect or disconnect the, the different volumes. <coughs> uh, 
The next project to show, uh, uh, to show is, was completed a year ago. Uh, it is a renewal project for 20 years old TEPCO Energy Museum. Uh, TEPCO is a Tokyo <coughs> electric power supply company. Its first and second floor need to be reconstructed as a new interface with changing Shibuya publics. This urban screensaver, we, we call it, is set against circular stairs and an entrance hall in front is glazed with DPG system and glass mullion with highly transparent glass. This makes the LED, sc LED screen appears as a moving facade of Shibuya city producing new relationship to the information, lighting, or electricity, and the city. Here, Louvre as urban screensaver, this urban screensaver, this section here. And the entrance hall is um, right here. And uh, open connection to the pedestrian. Uh, urban screen saber, saber we call uh, the LED display system. Each dot of LED is composed of nine diodes, three red, three green, and three blues, and there are uh, 1,088 dots, and uh, 32 dots vertical and 34 lines horizontal, and in total, nearly 10,000 diodes create more than 20,000 colors. The resolution, of, or DPI, of image is intentionally lower to make it appear rather li as lightings than information screen. When you are close inside the space, it appears as an environmental installation of moving lights. And when you are away outside the building, the moving images get focused to be recognized. Uh, here, this diag diagram is a result of the research done at the location uh, changes in number of pedestrians, cars, and trains, and their speed or temp tempo uh, or interval, direction, noise, and so on. By collect collecting those information and reflect those to the program of the urban screensaver uh, together with the sensors set at the lower end of each louvre, urban screensaver becomes a kind of reflection of urban activity visualized in the way people can recognize. Okay, the next one is, here is a photograph of the highway structure and junction. And these were built for Tokyo Olympic, happened in 1964, and, and massive continuous structure going through the whole Tokyo, creating unique urban scape of Tokyo. And then CMS3 project is in a way related to uh, this uh, structure. And this project is a renovation project of abandoned building the building was built at the end of the bubble economic years at around 1990, and the owner fell into bankrupt at the end of the construction. Since then, it has been empty and had nobody using it. Uh, the building had black granite covered, strange and long corridor, which was so dark and empty like a kind of a complete blank space, as if no one can recognize its existence. It seems impossible to revitalize without demolishing the whole building. But we took the strategy that we don't touch on the original exterior surfaces, but
but to add new surfaces that are strong enough to banish the original surfaces and space, creating new long and flowing space into the depth of the space where a little pocket park also redesigned. Uh, these are the entrance of the front side building and it has openness to invite the people to come along. And these panels are made by aluminum panels. The funny thing is that the, when it was completed, these white floor or panels looks more like unreal computer drawings rather than the real object. Maybe because it is so contrasted from the original building or maybe because it is so thin and light becoming a visual flow for the perception of urban connectivity. A Tokyo Channel project uh, uh, actually uh, uh, Ken has been uh, talking and um, uh, just briefly, I think taking too long, uh, uh, go through. Uh, uh, we've done this uh, project with uh, West State from Netherlands and uh, 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 Tokyo's public space has been changed. This all can described already. So let's go through next. Next one, please. Next one, please. And we've been doing a Tokyo Canal project, which lasts uh, actually more than a year with the West State. And then uh, we've been doing a workshop and then a field work and then an exhibition all together, spending whole 2004. And then uh, uh, we've been uh, trying to uh, 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 extract the problem of a Tokyo uh, along the canals and rivers and so on. And then uh, uh, what was interesting it was um, the, uh, uh, such urban uh, part of a uh, uh, public part of Tokyo is not that flexible as we described in a smaller scale projects because it uh, to do with the government and uh, uh, also bureaucracy of Japan. And then each of the uh, part of a, a, a river, um, for example, the highway dealt with the highway section of the whole government, and uh, river is dealt with the Tokyo government, and the bank is dealt with the local government, and then they never talk to each other. So it's almost impossible to change the uh, river landscape of the Tokyo. So now we are trying to make up a kind of movement which kind of force the uh, government as well as the journalists and then also uh, locals to be able to make a new kind of fluidity between them. And then uh, uh, we're still working on this project and not completed and we are uh, uh, doing it for uh, making up a new project for 2004, but it's not a uh, 2005, but it's not finished and we are not yet uh, that clear about how to describe it for you. So uh, there's a, a homepage called uh, uh, Tokyo Canal uh, dot org. So maybe have a look and pre-check. And that is the last section. So finally, for our last large scale presentation. So L for large. Well, actually, in this case, L for long, so uh, <laughs> not long in time, long in length. Um, so this is, um, for us, really, um, there are three construction f fences we're going to show you. Um, we've been, <laughs> by chance, asked three times running now to look at construction fences right in the middle of Tokyo. This is in Har Harajuku. Again, it's the fashionable center. Um, and this was for, actually, a Hong Kong developer. Want to go the next Responding uh, to Tokyo is, we noticed so many times that when a building is taken down and then they put up construction fences, they said, what actually was there before? And you don't remember it uh, because the building in itself was really insif insignificant. Uh, same here on, Om on Omotesando where there was this insignificant uh, apartment building and, uh, Quite large, the, I mean, yeah. you, but you never noticed it. Although on the other side of the street, the foot traffic was quite high. On the, on, on the uh, construction fence side, people would just pass by and not notice the building there. So this developer in particular 
um, <coughs> asked us to uh, make a head-turning statement because from now on there was going to be this uh, commercial building which uh, you know he wanted people to take notice of. So it was like uh, head-turning, I think, uh, but it was also a turning point for construction fences in general uh, in Tokyo, where uh, construction fences uh, so far were just a, a reminder to the general public that you know a noisy, dirty, uh, dusty uh, construction site was going on behind it, and it was basically just an an an, uh, an apology for. Um, making such a mess and for being unsightly. Um, so uh, this construction fence was trying to do the opposite. Yeah. It's so actually called pika pika pretzel, and uh, which means pick, what? Pika pika means shiny. In Japanese. You go on. <laughs> so um, we started off here. Um, we'd actually been doing another pr project, uh, a temporary project, where we were using large inflatable balloons as roof canopies, and you'll see that uh, tomorrow. Um, and while we were uh, in Bristol t talking to Ka Cameron Balloons, we noticed this very high-tech balloon they were making. It was one of those balloons that flies around the world non-stop, one of the Branson uh, attempts at fl flying around the world. And uh, we found it incredibly high performance material and actually quite cheap for the actual amount of air area we needed. So we thought about making an inflatable construction fence. And uh, it seemed, because prices are very high in Tokyo for materials, it actually seemed quite cheap that we could make it from this inflatable balloon. Um, we started off originally making it as um, just an inflatable lilo, a long, flat, very mesian wall with vertical ribs in it. Um, and when we started talking to the engineers, we realized that it was going to go through a typh typhoon se season. So they suggested we made some holes in it. Um, we made the holes. And they ended up being the ribs. Instead of having the ver vertical ribs, um, the actual donut cen cen centers became the ribs, which held the two sides of this um, uh, thin balloon together. Then, um, so we, we pleased the engineers. Then we were talking to Cameron Balloons back in Br Bristol, and we were trying to keep it the top line incredibly straight along the top, um, just with these holes in it. Well, they said, if you do that, we're going to need some radial fins to keep the top in position. Why don't you round them off? So there we've gone from this Mesian, very nice silver foil, long, flat thing into some archigram uh, uh, pretzel. And we, we just decided to go with, with it. It was a very low cost pr project. We had no time. So we took the advice of the engineers, the advice of the um, balloon company. And this form came out almost automatically, which is quite a funny thing. We didn't thing. want to do that at all. <laughs> no, we didn't want to do that. But it's actually quite in interesting when you see the process and you actually let something go and don't get too uh, worried about it. Uh, that was very successful. It turned lots of heads. It was on TV. It was in all the magazines. Um, and on the exactly the same site, uh, Virgin Atlantic asked us to do something si similar. Can you keep t t turning heads? for um, another couple of months. So at this point, the, they've finished the basement in the building, and they're just beginning to put, put in the ground floor slab. So for two months, we had 700 mil, 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 millimeters of space to, to play with. That's the, the only piece we'd got. And um, what we did here, I, I managed to get the actual advertising space for free, because it was just a construction fence at that time, and the company hadn't thought of actually renting it. So. I persuaded the client to give me the um, construction fence for free. And Virgin, for this type of uh, um, hoarding in Japan, um, advertising hoarding, would have to spend about $300,000 for two months. So I took that money and then turned it into uh, what we call uh, Wonderwall. And it's an interactive construction fence. Um, Virgin Atlantic wanted an awareness campaign. And uh, what they've done in Hong Kong to do that is they painted the Star Ferry in red. So they were asking us, well, we want to do something in the center of Tokyo. Where is the center of Tokyo? <laughs> it's like Shibuya, Shinjuku, Ikebukuro, <laughs> Roppongi. Tokyo there is station. no center. But it was just when the iMode um, came out on the phone so, uh, That's the internet-enabled phones, which we all have now, but this is 1999. Okay, so that's what we thought was going to be the next center of Tokyo. 
yeah, when we did this, there were 26 million p people already connected by the I mode. So <coughs> instead of taking the center of t Tokyo as actual location, we took it. We, we tried to find. We found this virtual set center, which was this I, I mode phone, so everybody could connect. And we devised a game which ev which ev which ev everybody could play. Every hour, a new qu question was asked by this tick ticker tape which ran across the construction fence. Um, and you could answer it by going to the iMode site on your phone. Um, and it was always a number. It was how, how many m miles between L London and Tokyo, how old's Richard Branson, really interesting things like that. And um, so you, you, you answered the, the question on your phone. And at the end of the hour, the server, um, which was a big Apache server, um, would actually send the answers or would, would send out the answers to the, to, to, to the phones. It, it would tell you. If you got it wrong, what the answer was, it would tell you if you had actually got the question right. And if there was more than one w w winner, it would actually say you were in a lottery and you were drawn out. And it would actually phone you and t tell you which, which prize you had won. So it's all fairly interesting and quite high tech and it all kind of worked. Um, the most interesting thing was the day we launched it, there was a press conference. And there's about the same number of people in this room, about two, two, 200 people in the room. And everybody got an iMode phone or they'd been lent, lent one. And everybody played the 10 o'clock question. And bang on 11 o'clock when the Apache server, which could send out 300 mails a second, it sent these. It spammed everybody who played the game. 200 phones rang in the room at the same time, which was pretty amazing. Within a second, all these phones were ringing. And it was, you know, you know what it's like when one phone rings in a, in a room. Um, it was pretty amazing. And we'd rigged it so two, <coughs> so two people had won flights to the UK. So it was pretty interesting. But this raised a lot of qu questions for us. Is, is this architecture? Is it, you know, is it, um, is it art? Um, is it streetscape? Is it an installation? Um, it's probably the biggest interactive billboard in the world. And, but it was uh, the first that we know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, maybe the L stands for um, large advertising, and uh, we're still advertising now to all of you. This is, this is an inter the, what Virgin like about this is the collateral um, ad advertising they get from something like this. It's been covered in a lot, a lot of magazines, but also we talk, it, we, we talk to you about it tonight. So it's how that you can actually extend, um, just with a print ad, it's there and gone, but this actually has some kind of longevity. And actually pe pe people still talk about it So um, in, in Tokyo. Okay, we've done the uh, inflatable, inflated. interactive. Now, uh, what's uh, beyond that? Um, a growing, um, <laughs> a growing hoarding. This is on also on Omotasando. It's uh, 274 meters long. The previous ones were just 34 meters long. Um, it's uh, surrounding uh, Tadao's Ando uh, construction <coughs> site and uh, is going to be there for at least three years, uh, depending how long the construction is, maybe longer. And uh, previously on that side, there, was, uh, there were lovely uh, old 1930s apartment called uh, the Do Dojunkai Apartments, and they were all overgrown with uh, ivy, which made them very endearing. Um, to uh, uh, the people of Tokyo and the passers-by. Um, we took a hint from that and thought, okay, um, you know, no ugly construction sites, of course. Uh, let's give some kind of green and refreshing park back to the people who pass by there. Uh, so we imagined this green, green screen, um, not just real green planting, but also green graphics and uh, hopefully um, green advertising. <laughs> so the, um, well, one of the key things about this, this construction fence was going to be there for three years. So we're trying to find something that actually improved with time, as opposed to something which, did, did, which actually deteriorated. So we, we saw this, this green hedge getting thicker and stronger, uh, which, which, which it has done. Um, and we're now in its, it's in its second, or we second year now, yeah. Um, it needs a, f a fair bit of maintenance. In the spring it goes cr crazy, they have to clip it all down. Um, and then in the winter it dies, it dies back again. But um, it's a series of barcodes, of, of strips, there are, there are 13 different types of plants. Um, and um, we've got lavenders and plants which smell. The other interesting thing is during the summer months when you walk down here, it's actually very, very cool. 
the plants actually cool, cool, cool the air down. So it actually, it actually, by chance, it conditions the pa pavement, which was something we didn't think about. So that's our last pro pro project. So we're over time, but we'll hand back to Ken. Alpha for last. <laughs> Alpha last. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, um, to continue our letters, um, perhaps um, C <laughs> is one word that, um, or one letter that um, I can talk about, about a little bit, um, because we've really yeah. seen just, so much um, constant change um, in these projects, um, especially through these um, construction walls. Um, but also, it's perhaps really interesting to see these two firms together um, as part of a generation of real collaboration um, that uh, is perhaps a contrast from uh, the era of Ando Ito, the single architect. Um, and it's, it's, I think, very unique to see um, this in action um, through these presentations, but um, also um, very much through the different types of projects that um, that can um, really facilitate. Um, some other words to just think about. I, I really would like to have us discuss this um, all together and um, please think about questions that you would like to ask um, as we uh, talk at the beginning a little bit about some of the, um, these main issues. But um, some of the other words, the C words that um, come up perhaps are the context. You know, what is really Tokyo as opposed to um, London perhaps is a little bit easier to kind of grasp <laughs> in terms of uh, a set fixed, um, slightly uh, less uh, rapidly changing um, one than, than Tokyo, as we've seen. Um, but also the craft and construction of um, really building some of these structures um, of, uh, that might be perhaps a little bit more difficult to um, actually build here. Um, but also the adventurous clients um, that really uh, take faith in, in some of these ideas that um, might seem uh, a little bit um, controversial, but um, uh, really um, having the, the faith in doing that. Um, but so at this point, um, I would like to start with a few questions um, that hopefully will open up to a um, larger discussion. But um, first, to actually, uh, if um, both Teledesign and Klein Dytham can speak a little bit more about how they work in collaboration with um, the rest of the people in their offices um, and um, with their um, contractors and um, how that really enables a lot of these things to um, happen. Okay. Um, the, yes, uh, 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 when I was uh, kind of uh, learning about architecture, uh, everyone uh, talked about architects as a kind of omnipotent, you know, he can decide everything, he can do anything. And then when I started working by myself in a society or in anywhere, in any place, the, uh, I realized it's not true. You know, architects cannot work you know, without any other people. And then um, now there's quite a lot of uh, genres and areas surrounding the architecture and then uh, uh, one project uh, can be um, kind of uh, completed by those support. And then look at the film industry, and if you, if you look at the movie, and at the end, they show all the lot of, lot of names at the end, and they're showing the movie is made by so many people's effort. And architects never do this. They hide who worked with, with them. And I decide everything, or something like that. And then uh, my, our idea is quite opposing to the traditional idea of architects. And then uh, we really want to kind of appreciate the other specialist ideas. For example, uh, we worked uh, with the uh, lighting designer for the uh, TEPCO uh, <coughs> museum or so on. And so um, I think uh, uh, collaboration is quite a uh, 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 big keyword to be able to produce something um, um, kind of a fitting to the uh, gen generation of today. Mm. I mean, we, we always talk about ourselves as directors, a film director, re 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 really from that. You know, mm. the, you know, there's us, there's the engineer, there's the landscape designer, Toshio Iwai, who programmed the, the Bloomberg Ice, uh, Namaiki, our graphic design company that we work with to do the graphics on the, uh, on the, on the green wall. Um, we actually share our office, it's called Deluxe, and there are five co companies we share that with. And they're all graphic discipline. They're graphic designers, computer, uh, gra graphic com company, um, a DJ, 
and sometimes we collaborate and sometimes we don't. So we're a very loose collaborative, which is called Deluxe. And uh, we also have another space called Super Deluxe, which I'll talk about a bit, a bit about tomorrow night. But again, that's slightly wider, and um, it's an exhibition space, event space, um, where there are about 25 events a month there. And actually, we use that as a, a research a area, but it is very much about teamwork um, and pull, well, pulling people together. Collaboration is a big thing, I think, even also in the office. We very much encourage um, our staff people who we work with to um, voice their opinion. I mean, simply, four eyes see more than two eyes, six eyes see more than two eyes, and so on. So it's, uh, it's more like a big brainstorming session amongst uh, specialists. Mm. And uh, we do the editing at the end. Huh? We have Hikaru here from the office, and so she can vouch for us if we're making this up, but there's actually no ownership. Somebody else who's been with us too. Yep. <laughs> Um, there's no ownership of ideas as such. <coughs> Most of those things on, that you've seen, um, I don't think Astrid and I know where the ideas have come from. Um, we, can't, we can't say, oh, that was Astrid's idea, or my idea, or somebody's in the office. It, mm. Things come up around a table, and they get massaged, and there's ping, ping pong between you and the cl yeah. client, you and the group. And there's not, that's my de detail. I know when I worked in Lon London, there was, there was this kind of, um, incestuous ownership of ideas and details and right. things within the office and people trying to protect their area and we've just thrown it op open and as I explained with the um, inflatable construction fence that was so different the result was so different to what uh, the first con concept was all about and it was a collaboration with the balloon company a collaboration with the, en with the engineer and the, and the client as well you know um, it's not just about that straight line. Uh, I totally agree with Mark. Like, uh, and, uh, uh, we deal with a huge scale and a small scale. So in case of the housing, like a uh, sheet house, uh, mainly I and Kuno is engaged in designing that one. But uh, we uh, get together in the uh, shared space called uh, Studio Nob, and then we discuss on the table, open table, and then sometimes uh, like uh, Tajima-san, uh, Tajima is passing through by. Yeah. Uh, his, uh, his interest in the, some, uh, we, uh, the idea which we talk about, and then he popped in. He said, maybe make uh, this, uh, this door work. <laughs> Let's make the door. <laughs> so try so not to stick to our own simple idea. Maybe this is so uh, narrow-minded. Maybe if you know, uh, get another idea, try to uh, challenge it, yeah. and then make something better. <coughs> this is the, uh, Nice, nice, nice thing to do, the co collaboration. I think one of, <coughs> one of, probably if you study in the West, you tend to think in straight lines when you're actually having I I ideas and thoughts. I know I come from the sort of Foster and Rogers school where you have an idea and you've got to follow that all the way through in a straight line. But when we worked in Ito's of office, it was very, very di different. And it'd start off and then they'd go over there a little bit and then, then they'd maybe go up <laughs> on this direction and somewhere over there. And then you go on this incredible journey. Um, and you get this sort of cloud of ideas, but at the end, something coalesced, something came together, something condensed, and you got a very pure thought out of a cloud of ideas. And before, we'd been just running in a damn straight line. So there's no wrong or, or right way, you know. Um, that certainly is, is, isn't a wrong way, it's a very in, in, in interesting way. But that's what we found in, in Japan, that we actually opened ourselves up a lot more to different directions. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, how do you construct these cloud of ideas? I mean, my question being how you um, see the construction industry in, in Japan as opposed to here. Um, perhaps, you know, it's, it's really amazing to actually see some of these very adventurous ideas actually built. And so um, how do you see this um, relationship um, in Japan as opposed to um, having done some work here in, um, in the UK? Um, sure. Um, the, it's quite difficult to describe the actually differences uh, between Japan and UK because I don't know <coughs> the UK industry scene. But anyway, the start uh, from the um, writing by the uh, Rem Kohlhart when he had built the uh, uh, building in Japan, and uh, um, the, what he said is um, uh, the he imagined to talk about with the con con construction people, 
starting from basement and structure and then exterior walls and interior and so on in order as the building is built. But when he came to Japan, what happened is that he, he talked uh, from the maybe roof, window, or interior, or basement, all in the kind of wrong order, in <coughs> a random order, and he was so shocked. And then uh, uh, that's something I, uh, for the first time, uh, heard that the people talk about from the basement to the, uh, anyway, the final finish. Mm -hmm. And what is funny is, um, uh, uh, I think, without knowing what you built on, on a structure, we, you cannot decide the basement. Without knowing the finishes, you cannot decide the structure, so on. So actually, the, when the order is uh, reversed or so on, then you can decide a lot more many things, or so on. So maybe um, uh, I cannot really tell the differences, but um, in Japan, it might happen in a kind of a more confusing way in the middle. <laughs> and then and finish it, when it, they all come together and finish it, and so on. How do you think? Um, I think the biggest difference is there's a desire to build in Japan. People want to build good things, they want to make a good job, there's pride in what they do. And working in Europe, um, there seems to be war when you've signed a con contract. You start fighting with a contractor, letters start flying around, and you have this legal night, night, nightmare to deal with. Um, we have single con page contracts, um, we don't have to spend any time with lawyers, we have no liability, the liability rests with the construction company, which I think is a very good idea. We use their, we use their knowledge, their databases um, to get things made, but that it's, for, for me it's just this desire to actually build something good and, w and work as a team, work as a team with the construction company and not fight the construction company, that's the biggest difference for us I think. We have actually come to an hour and a half, but I know some people probably have some burning questions. So um, if you can be patient, um, uh, if we can have um, a few questions um, at this point. Uh. Is it coincidence or is that the balloons that you ended up going to Bristol? They just said, <laughs> um, it just sounds then really strange that it, it was easier to go to Bristol to find these things. Um, it, 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 it was just cheaper in Bristol. <laughs> we could actually get them made in Japan, to be honest. Um, but it was, it, we were just working on another project for Virgin, and um, we were just over there, and I rang up and said, how, how much to make these balloons? There were was, was three times more expensive in Japan. Um, but to be honest, um, Cam, Cam, Cameron Balloons, who made them, are not a construction company, and there was a desire, a total desire on their side. They were very Japanese, we talked about this. Mm -hmm that they were amazing because they were really into making these damn things, you know. And there was, you know, went to Bristol and they showed us around the factory. And it was just like being in Japan. Um, so that does exist in, in the UK. But I think you all know what I'm talk to, talking about this, you know, this war with the contractors. <laughs> Other questions? I think uh, in case of the teledesign is I think rare uh, because uh, we are uh, researching about you know uh, urbanism at the same time and then try to you know find a way to extract the idea from the urban condition today. So usually in the practice, you know, most of the uh, firm architecture firm concentrates on design the building, just only that. I think you're right about mm. the way you work with urbanism, but I think on a more broader level, mm. I think collaboration is quite, you know, me can go me. Um, there, is, there, is, there is like a move, mm. and what was quite refreshing for us, we have been in Japan and working for Ito, then we set up on our own, and we're doing our own little, little thing, and then we bump into Sean and Sam from FAT, and realize that there's a similar sort of collaboration, teamwork going on. They're not just interested in architecture per se. And I think we have found that you know, there are a lot of pr practices that are getting in inspiration uh, that they're, they're not just involved in this, you know, the pure bit building. They're, they're interested in broader things, whether it's furniture or product design or web, 
interfaces or you know com or communication devices. So I think we're all that there are a lot. It's it's a lot different to when we first arrived, where there was these you know, the pure architect, and the younger practices are opening up. There is more collaboration um, go going on, and Teledesign are a good example of that. But I think there is you know, but I think that's happening in the UK too. There's more collaboration beginning to go on. I don't think it's just in Japan. One last question. Yeah, uh, when we first got there, it was uh, still the bubble, and uh, so construction companies were absolutely busy, and all they were interested in is like uh, you know finishing one project so they can do the next one and make even more money on that one. And uh, at that time, they were so busy, they were not interested in, um, in doing sort of strange and challenging and experimental one-offs. Uh, that would take too much time and, uh, you know, a loss of money, really, if they took too much time because they couldn't do the next project. So uh, invariably, the, the tenders for those unusual projects, which we were producing, uh, were about... Uh, T ten times more expensive than they should be, so uh, you know just to kind of say get off, get rid of this, and um, so with um, with the bubble uh, bursting, uh, this disappeared. I mean, there was not there's not so much uh, money sloshing about anymore, and people started uh, using their brain and thinking how can we use our limited resources in a, in a cleverer way. Um, still having impact, and this is where it all started to become a lot more interesting. Um, you know, um, where where we are good at actually um, coming from uh, Europe. Uh when we were in recession, <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we were at college, it was always in recession. But I think abroad, um, I, I think it's the most interesting time in Japan now since we've been there. A lot of that is to do the, with the recession, the slowdown. We're now we're now in post-recession Japan. And many, and you can tell me if I'm wrong in a minute, but um, we just feel that this lifetime employment has stopped. Um, most people can't leave university and go to a good job. Um, there's certainly not a lot of lifetime employment. So people are kind of hanging out. They're, they're setting up like Jun Takahashi. We've done the, the tube bit, bit building for a very, very young guy, 32, I think. He's got a very large company now. He left school and went out on his own and started design, making, designing T-shirts and things. And you're seeing this new economy in, in Japan coming out of the recession. Young, young people not really trusting the banks and the government and things like that. And so there is this kind of punk movement, movement in Japan. And, you know, re re really like, you know, in the 70s in the UK, and punk, punk evolved, you know, it's very strong. Well, I'd, I'd rather say uh, there are many, there are more creative mm. Um, mm. people who wouldn't have been creative if there was lifetime employment are now actually trying to make ends meet by themselves. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, it, in the bubble years, it was crazy, not exciting. You know, yeah. Everyone <laughs> just spent money for nothing. But um, um, mid-90s was um, not that good, quite tough yeah. period. Yeah. And, and then uh, uh, it was quite difficult to, uh, for example, uh, construct the real building with uh, kind of fine ideas or so on. People just didn't try so much. but. Recently, last couple of four, four years, three years, mm -hmm. I think people become had become more enthusiastic about uh, uh, different ideas and different things. And then uh, uh, some of also construction companies also uh, sometimes, not all the time, uh, sometimes show their enthusiasm to the those ideas and so on, and the clients as well. So maybe it is slowly kind of a uh, <coughs> departing and in, and in a better way. I think so. Maybe exciting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like this segment, we um, we just found out there are m there's more construction going on in Japan now than there was in the bubble. Oh really? Um, there's more floor er area being built at the moment than there oh, was in the bu bubble. They just keep being very quiet mm -hmm. about it, so mm -hmm. they, <laughs> the, the interest rates up. But it, it is, you know, as Taichi san said, it's beginning to it's back on the upswing yeah, again. Yeah, I think, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Hopefully, that will pique everyone's interest in seeing really what will be the next. 
um, incarnation of this, um, of the work that will come from Teledesign and Klein Dytham. And um, I encourage you to uh, really look at the exhibitions very carefully because they do keep changing them um, from day to night. Um, and um, also, um, Klein Dytham, as you probably <coughs> know, will be speaking tomorrow night as well. So you'll be able to hear more of um, some of these projects. Um, but uh, I would like to really thank the, the speakers for um, their uh, long efforts this evening. And, um. Thank you. Thank you.